another nail in my coffin! Hey everybody, it's me, your friendly neighborhood Uncle Pete, and this is my series, Let's Nail This. So, welcome back to my channel. It's been a while since I've had one of these episodes, and if you are new here, this is my Let's Nail This series, where viewers try and fix the kills that I gave one nail in a coffin to in my Nails in a Coffin series. In my Nails in a Coffin series, I evaluate a victim's response to life-threatening situations based on a rating system I've coined Nails in a Coffin. When someone is confronted with like a dire circumstance, their actions and decisions determine the number of nails they receive. Now, they do really make smart decisions, they exhibit like resilience, they fight really hard to survive. They can earn up to a commendable four nails in a coffin. However, what we mostly see is they make blunders, engage in careless actions, make stupid decisions, such as freezing in place or running upstairs instead of seeking safety outside. I find that appropriate to give that person one nail in a coffin. So there's a lot of stupid decisions we see in horror movies, like again, like splitting up, running, not running away, ignoring warnings, choosing bad hiding spots, or waiting till midnight to go investigate a haunted house. It can be frustrating when you see a victim do something so stupid. So you may have even said to yourself, hey, if that was me, I would have done this. And that's where Let's Nail This comes into place. I'm assigning people kills that I gave one nail in a coffin to because the victim was pretty much stupid. They, in turn, get to tell the YouTube audience what they would have done if they were in the victim's position. They just have to keep it based in reality. You can't say you would go Chuck Norris or John Wick on everybody. Unless, you're in fact, one of those two people. <laughs> in this episode, we have my longtime friend and one of the biggest supporters of my channel, who I can never thank enough, AJ. And this is actually his second appearance on Let's Nail This, and he actually requested... This kill, and I had no problem doing that for him. He's a big fan of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, so I gave him a fun set of kills. I signed him Buzz and Rick from the opening to that movie. They were super dumb when we first saw them introduced into this movie. They were reckless, obnoxious, pretentious. I don't think anybody was sad to see these two idiots die. You know, their first mistake was playing chicken with the truck, and then once they stopped on the bridge, they had lots of options they could have taken. Drive straight, just stop the car, do something. And the car, the truck was driving in reverse. So they made a lot of stupid decisions. But let's find out what AJ has to say about these kills. So AJ, let's nail this. Salutations all. Juiciest slice here. Back not so much due to popular demand as by way of extortion, blackmail, and threat of other strong arm tactics. Because after my first turn, I begged for, nay demanded, an encore specifically to cover the one-nail deaths of Buzz and Rick. Kidding, of course. I asked Uncle Pete if I could, and he said that would be cool. What I'm not joking about is my desire, need even, to pontificate about Buzz and Rick. Why? Because they crap away everything through sheer stupidity, and for no good reason other than they thought it was cool to be jerks. Yet, yet, weirdly, their status as instigators actually in a roundabout way makes them the unsung heroes of this movie. With some blood on their hands, sure. Poor LG, he earned his four nails the hard way. But heroes nonetheless, because the blame for the events of the film lie at their feet. But that also includes the downfall of the nefarious Sawyers. But I'll get to that soon enough. The film opens with the intolerable buzz and equally annoying Rick blazing down a rural highway to the Dallas Cotton Bowl. The recent high school graduates are in what looks like a brand spanking new Mercedes 380 SL, so definitely entitled rich kids. Using a Smith & Wesson model M&P to make target of mailboxes and signs, <laughs> because apparently destruction of property is cool, I never got that memo and being generally awful by using a car phone back when those weren't common to harass. This is Stretch on an open request line on Kay Oakland in Burt Burnett, Texas, Red River Rock and Roll. The film's final woman. Oh, you mean we're on the road to nowhere? No, man, we're on the road to Texas, are you? We go to Dallas. <laughs> You're on the road to nowhere. <laughs> they come upon a pickup and for the lulls initiate a game of chicken. <laughs> They, of course, managed to win. Later, 
They're once again on the phone with Stretch when they reach surely one of the longest bridges in film history and, their antics backfiring on them in stunning fashion, are stopped in their tracks by the pickup. <laughs> Buzz tries to drive around, but the pickup reverses and manages to keep the vehicle side by side as they race across the bridge. <laughs> Leatherface, wearing taxidermy brothered nubbins as part of a particularly disturbing ghillie suit, attacks with an enormous chainsaw, causing a great deal of damage by taking the roof right off their car, including sawing right through Buzz's head. The car then drives off the embankment, killing Rick. The authorities attribute this to drunken joyriding, but we know the truth. Perfectly accompanied by the Oingo Boingo song, No One Lives Forever, this is a spectacular way to kick off the film, which was good since, for a movie with Massacre in the title, it has precious few kills. So this sequence had to act as a cornerstone, and therefore needed to be a sensational rip snorter of an opening. I think it succeeded. From the jump, bad decisions guide events, since the boys choose to drink and drive before the film even opens. So this sequence acts as a cautionary tale about the perils of traveling intoxicated, though I doubt it received the endorsement of Mothers Against Drunk Driving. These guys burst into our lives already thoroughly wasted, so right off, maybe don't imbibe on a road trip. Could all their bad decisions be attributed to inebriation? Without impairment, everything might have gone differently. Being under the influence too often augments the worst instincts and encourages bad behavior, undoubtedly in play here, since they are a bit over the top in their obnoxiousness. What about when confrontation ended the fun? People can get sober immediately under the right circumstances such as a spike of adrenaline due to fear, but even without that happening, I still think their decisions resoundingly stupid for dude bro guys who I'm guessing had tanked more than a few beers before that day. The drinking age in Texas was raised from 19 to 21 in 1984, so they are underage. But based on their rampant and unbridled behavior, it's likely they were hardcore partiers. What I'm saying is they aren't afraid to flagrantly drink and drive and seem to handle their booze fine when they're cruising, shooting, and making prank phone calls. I would guess they had done a fair bit of talking their way out of trouble while soused, and should have had good enough heads on their shoulders to recognize when they went too far or should retreat. Maybe they didn't know they happened upon members of maybe the one family in Texas that if overheard saying they're going to spare you, they mean process you into spare ribs. But they should have known it was possible their BS would peeve off the wrong person. Someone quick to violence, someone not afraid to do them harm. Maybe they just didn't care because they felt daddy's money insulated them from all that. With their blatant attitude of conferring a right to do damage for their own entertainment, I feel like the mischievous pair would have acted like a couple of yuppie douchebags no matter what. So maybe there's inevitability to it all, and trouble would have befallen them even without the toxicant lubrication. Lack of respect is a huge precipitator. The best idea, respect others in places where respect is demanded. Don't run people off the road as a lark and a cheap thrill, and expect that to in every instance go unavenged. I don't know if it was an unintended consequence of being incapable of predicting high definition or what, but it's clear during the game of chicken no one's in the pickup's passenger seat. <laughs> Suggesting Chop Top was alone since Leatherface wasn't likely capable of driving on his own, and Drayton tools around in their catering truck. Maybe Leatherface was lying down in the bed of the pickup, but I feel like a body-sized mass would have gotten jostled enough to be seen when the pickup hit the ditch. In that case, I have to imagine that right after that happened, Chop Top raced to the nearby Texas Battleland, <laughs> grabbed Leatherface and Nubbins and was like, those dog dicks can lick my plate, we're gonna get them, Bubba. And then he used Mrs. Todd's shortcut to get ahead of Buzz and Rick at the bridge because considering the ill-fated pair was shown to be speeding, it had to be some crazy trick of physics and hyperspace to beat them there. Of course he knew where they'd be going because music is his life, Stretch is his favorite DJ, and he was listening when the pair called in. But I digress. Since the two numbskulls seemed Texas-born, even as rich kids they should have known better. I saw this movie at maybe too early an age, but even then, as a kid, 
I knew enough about Texas to understand it's a place where disrespect isn't tolerated. To be fair, I had done a school report and Texas history conveyed the notion it's a place where people have a deeply instilled sense of pride and self-preservation. A place where speaking out of turn could lead to a duel. And even if you're invited, you could be met with the muzzle of a gun until your identity is confirmed. A little just in case, baby. Basically, a place where excessive retribution might not necessarily be expected, but is maybe a little more likely to happen than in places without such strong identities related to preservation instinct. In no uncertain terms, Texas is a place where fools aren't suffered kindly, and Buzz and Rick do nothing but act the fool. Then when confronted, these doofs dared to act offended, like they're the ones being wronged. Are you crazy? Are they crazy? You guys ran a truck off the road, and when it magically got ahead of you, you muster nothing better than to act like entitled doinks. Just because someone is country doesn't mean city folk have a right to make sport of them, something these guys, from their lofty positions, apparently learned way too late. Really shows how unwise and wet behind the ears they really were. Looking down the pickup's headlights, I see no scenario better than seeking to escape. Going back seems the best bet, but they are intent on getting to that party, and stubbornly go on. Why do they keep driving forward when that is so obviously stupid? Obstinacy and inflated confidence come to mind. Once confronted, they should have done anything to get turned around, and flee as quickly as possible. If driving into such circumstances isn't a red flag that they really screwed up, and these people, whoever they happen to be, were likely intent on doing them some harm, I don't know what is. They are in a Mercedes that can go speeds in excess of 120 miles per hour. Even if methods have been utilized to boost horsepower, a sports car would likely win a straight up race against a 1983 Chevrolet C10 Silverado. This is not the time for engagement, or any action that can be construed as escalation. But then that they're in a sports car could be what empowers Buzz to go on. Why he believes they can outrun the pickup. Still, the only reason to proceed would be entitlement and arrogance, which does seem to typify them. To be fair, they are at that age when youthful bravado rules all. A period of development when people believe themselves indestructible, invincible, and untouched by the prospect of death. But that doesn't let them off the hook. It's called discretion. I might be beating a dead horse, but they are Texans. They should be aware Texans can be armed and vengeful. Like, I would say they were lucky to be met by a chainsaw rather than, say, double-barrel shotguns, or who even knows what. Though a respectable firearm and one used by law enforcement, did they really think their revolver could stand up to any of the number of high-powered firearms a Texan might possess? I wouldn't be surprised if there are folks driving around with elephant guns, even flamethrowers. Interesting fact, in most places flamethrowers are legal to build and own, just not legal to discharge. Sort of an interesting catch-22, and I hope an indication that there would be discretion in regard to legal charges, since there are probably legitimate reasons to discharge a flamethrower. Furthermore, when the truck can keep up all side by side and even wrangle them to some degree, maintaining distance, why did Buzz humor the interaction? Why not slam on the brake, shift into reverse, and try to backtrack to the mouth of the bridge? It would have taken Chop Top a moment to change course, maybe enough of an interval to buy the time to turn around. In the interim, Rick could have at least shot at the oncoming object. I guess at that point they're just too committed. Talking about committed, at first, Leatherface seems to be having a rollicking good time. I'm guessing this is because Chop Top had him all hyped up, and he was having a hoo-ha in his way, doing some damage but maybe not as intent on killing right off. What maybe soured his mood? Rick fired off a shot, which caused Nubbin's head to get knocked off to the side, exposing the subterfuge. I feel like aiming at the head of the figure in the bed of the pickup was a poor choice. I don't think Leatherface was wearing a bulletproof vest, nor was the taxidermied body bulletproof. Had Rick aimed mid-level instead of up, toward the midsection instead of the head, it would have been a much larger target, and far more likely to fell the guy wielding the crazy big chainsaw. 
I suppose there was a chance Leatherface could have been wounded in the head or even killed, but in failing, the shot was wasted and was maybe the action that sealed their fates. Here, I posit the possibility that until that happened, this might have all been a scary tit-for-tat prank meant to fill them with the fear of God, so to speak, but not necessarily end with their murders. It was a risky and brazen thing, and there was a lot on the line for both sides. If killing were the intent, toying around at all was pointless. Also, if that were the plan, there are easier ways to go about it, ways the meat could have been recovered. But then Chop Top wasn't the most reasonable guy, so that might all be a whole lot of hot air. But, for Leatherface, after being exposed, what seemed playful suddenly took on serious dimensions, as his intentions seemed to shift from messing around to murderous, and he quickly takes apart the Mercedes like he's removing the lid from a can of garbanzo beans, which is what Buzz and Rick were, a pair of dumb garbanzo beans. So, I got all this way and only then did I realize all my approaches were avoidant, reactive, and run away with their tails between their legs sort of maneuvers. And I thought that's kind of lame, and perhaps there was a proactive approach Buzz and Rick could have used to obtain their objective, which was sallying forth to get to the party. Then it hit me like a lightning bolt out of the sky. Why not employ their smug, reckless, overly privileged boldness and youthful audacity? These puerile and immature guys clearly pictured themselves at the top of the pecking order, and the world was their oyster to be deshelled at their will. Besides, together the pair was a self-contained bolstering device, egging each other on. When the pickup made them stop, they could have quickly formulated a plan to see what they were up against. By this, I mean Rick could have jumped out, and using the door as a shield, aimed at the driver and inquired as to what they wanted, and in so doing, they would have seen what they were up against. Despite Texas being a very well-armed state, why this might have worked in this instance is that nowhere in this film are the Sawyers depicted as having firearms, when maybe they should. Perhaps it's a matter of honor for them, killing with hammers, hooks, and chainsaws, really getting their hands dirty. But this would make them vulnerable even to a single revolver at close range, especially the one the pair happened to possess. Chop Top would have been in the cab alone since Leatherface would have been waiting in the truck bed. At threat of death, Rick could have held them at bay as Buzz drove past the pickup. Proximity would have made Chop Top and Leatherface defenseless, because he could oscillate between them without enough distance for one or the other to get the jump on him. Though Leatherface popping up like a jack-in-the-box might have been a startle big enough to shift the tides. But if he kept his cool, from there, Rick could have gotten back into the Mercedes, and they could have gotten out of there. For good measure, he could have even tried to shoot out one of the pickup's rear tires. This all would maybe require a bit more chutzpah than these guys had, but I hope this imagining makes this a little more captivating. As for Chop Top and Leatherface, the whole thing was a terrible idea and ultimately a giant debacle. Any retribution not worth the cost. And you know their brother Drayton would have been sourly opposed to the whole shebang, acutely aware, as he was, of the fine balance monsters like them needed to maintain to operate in the world. Man, man builds a, a good sturdy trade. The gods just kick him right in the balls. <laughs> Not the gods, his own brothers. They should have only been killing to procure meat for their catering business. Well, they shouldn't have been killing at all, but you know what I mean. Because in the end, due to Buzz and Rick's deaths being sound recorded and later broadcast by Stretch, the Sawyer's whole gambit and game was unraveled once and for all. Since this incarnation of the family has never been resurrected, the final member slain by the valedictory Stretch. <laughs> So, despite being drunken idiots on a mission to annoy, and in the end certainly recipients of Darwin Awards, assuming they hadn't knocked up any high school girls, Buzz and Rick managed to perhaps save many, many lives, and many, many people from unwittingly participating in cannibalism. So, Buzz and Rick, for the win? Anywho, from drinking and driving to playing chicken with strangers to getting in a race on an insanely long bridge, 
Buzz and Rick courted disaster, and through a myriad of increasingly bad choices, got themselves unalived in graphic fashion, but in the end theirs was a more noble sacrifice than one might expect. Well, I think I've exercised the demons and will no longer be plagued by the dunderheadedness of Buzz and Rick, and their unfortunate but seemingly inevitable comeuppance at the hands of Chop Top and Leatherface. I want to thank Uncle Pete for letting me contribute another entry to this terrific series. I appreciate it a lot. These are a lot of fun. To him and to everyone else, thanks for listening to my ramblings. Please share any refutations, opinions, accusations, japes, or other ideas in the comments below. Bye now. That was great, AJ. I love how you brought up them being spoiled rich kids, making them prime victims for the chainsaw. It was nice to see how you explained them just vandalizing signs and having no, no regard for anybody led to their demise as well. It was an excellent breakdown on the many options these two had. They would have stood an excellent chance of not only avoiding one nail kill, but even surviving if they listened to what you said or they have done what AJ would have done. So, AJ, that was a great job. I really do appreciate you being part of this series again. So, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. That's another episode of Let's Nail This. If you would like to be part of this series, please send me an email. I'll have a link down in the, uh, in the description below. And I'll sign you one of the kills that I gave one now in a coffin too, because the victim made a lot of stupid decisions. I've covered Auto Friday the 13th, Halloween, Puppet Master, the first four Scream movies, Hatchet, um, in the middle of wrapping up, covering all the Saw movies. Those are all listed on my channel. I'll have some uh, links up here for you to check out. Yes, yeah, so you want to be part of it? Anybody can we do it? Doesn't matter to me. I, I love sharing, talking about Horace. I really do appreciate everybody. Well, I'll see you on Friday for another episode of Nails in a Coffin. And in two weeks, uh, there'll be another debate series with my good buddy, Carlin. Take care of yourselves, everybody. I hope you are all doing very well this season. Be good to each other. I am your friendly neighborhood Uncle Pete. And remember, with great kills, they must also come. Great nails.